After you've crafted an irresistible book blurb and a captivating cover, you still have one piece of design left, the interior of your book. Like other aspects of your book, your interior should at least look like it was professionally designed, even if you did it yourself. So today I want to talk about why the inside of your book needs professional design. Nothing says I published this myself faster than wonky margins or weird arrangement of the parts of your book. Interior book design includes things like your paper choice, your fonts, the order of the content of your book, and where graphics are placed. This is Ignited Ink Writing, a channel dedicated to helping writers like you transform your writing so it lingers with readers. Because writing that lingers gets remembered and recommended to others. I'm Caitlin Burvey, editor and writer. Let's start with paper and fonts subconsciously matter. When it comes to book design, don't automatically choose the cheapest option just because it's cheap. Quality does matter. White paper is cheaper than cream paper, but most readers prefer cream, even if they can't articulate why. Cream paper is easier to read, it has less of a glare on it, and the ink is less likely to bleed through because the paper is thicker. White paper is also reminiscent of textbooks, and you might not want that connotation associated with your book. Your paper choice, like other aspects of the production of your book, should be all about reader experience. The cheapest dimensions, paper choices, and spacing might not be best for your reader's experience. In a previous video, I mentioned your book should have two to three fonts max. This includes the interior fonts and the exterior fonts. Often you have one or two slightly fancy fonts that you use for titles, chapter headings, and things like that. The most important font is actually the one you're going to use for your body text. This font needs to both be associated with the tone of your story and really easy to read. That body text font is all about readability. You don't want to make your readers work harder to decipher your book, or they're going to pick a different book to read. Similarly, I'd like to talk about the power of white space. White space is essential to your book's success. Regardless of whether you're designing the paperback or the ebook version, white space matters. It's going to control your reader's emotional response to the text and the pacing. When a page is filled with tiny letters all squished together, your readers have to work to decipher that text. And if they're like me, they get flashbacks to their really hard intermediary metabolism course. That again makes your book feel like work and not like an enjoyable experience. So be aware of the effect your spacing is having on your reader's experience. Key places where you want white space is in the margins. Make sure those are big enough to make your page look like it's not just a wall of text. You also want to have space in between the lines. This is where you're really going to control the pace of your book. Often, young adult novels and books for kids have more spacing in between the lines than adult novels do. This is on purpose. It makes the kids feel like they're reading faster because they're turning the pages faster. This makes your story feel more exciting, and it can also help people who have a difficult time reading. There's less work per page, and it makes them feel like they're getting better. The space in between chapters is also vital to your book's success. Whether you're using traditional chapters or parts or something else, that white space gives your reader a moment to pause, take a breath, take in what they just read, and then dive into the next section. White space is a powerful tool and part of your interior design. Next, let's talk about images, figures, and graphs. If your book has a lot of images, figures, and graphs, you should seriously consider hiring a professional to design the interior of your book. Many of those figures and graphs might have to be redone in order to match the design of the inside of your book or just to match each other. That's going to take time and effort. Also, placing those images and graphs within the text itself is not as easy as you might think it is, so it's going to take time and energy to learn that program 
and how to get it to place things where you want them. If you are only going to write one book, it might not be worth your time and effort to learn these things. If you're going to write 10 books, it could very well be worth that time and effort because it's going to save you more money. When it comes to interior design of images, figures, graphs, and other things along those lines, think about how much your time is worth. Is it going to save you enough money to be worth the time it takes to learn those programs? Or would you rather pay someone else and save that time, spend that time with your family or on the next book? As a side note, don't bank on your readers actually reading that tiny text beneath images or figures or even in footnotes. A lot of readers completely ignore that. So don't put information that's vital to your reader's understanding of your book in those sections. Next, I'd like to review the order of contents. This is the traditional order of the sections of a book. Yes, it's a very long list, but the things in asterisks are optional, and I don't think I've ever seen a book that has all of these. Your first page is your half title page. This is where you put your primary title only. It's not going to have your subtitle or any names. Then you could put your series and other works here or at the end of your book. Next, you have your full title page. This has your whole title as well as your name, the illustrator's names, editors, translators, publishers, and other names along those lines. Then you have your copyright page. Next are a bunch of optional pages. You could have a dedication, an epigraph, a table of contents, a foreword, or a preface. Your acknowledgments can go after your preface or they can go after your story. Then you'll have your introduction or prologue, and finally, your story, yay! Next, you might have an epilogue. Then you could put your acknowledgments here. Then you have a bunch of optional sections again. You could have an appendix or chronology. You could have notes. Notes are a good place to put questions for book clubs. You could have a glossary and a bibliography. Then you're going to have your list of contributors or author bio. And if you use an illustrator, you'll put their credits or their bio next. You could have an index. And if you didn't put your collected works at the front of the book, they could go here. Again, try not to feel overwhelmed by this list. You're not going to have most of these in your book, most likely, and many of these pages are only for very specific types of books. I'd like to leave you with an editor's experience with interior book design. Last summer, I helped judge an indie book contest, and I was shocked at how important the interior design was to my reader experience. I could tell which authors had skimped on production costs because their books were some weird large shape and the ink bled through their thin white pages. These were authors who made me feel like they didn't care that much about their book, or they didn't care that much about me and my reader experience. When you create a cheap product, readers are not going to respect it. The biggest self-published giveaway as far as interior book design went for this contest was actually the order of the contents. Most authors managed to put the copyright and the title pages in the right spots, but everything else was this giant jumbled free-for-all. And even though as a reader and a writer, I'd never thought that hard about the order of the contents of a book, I noticed when things weren't in the right place. This took me out of the experience of the book, and it left me with this feeling that something was wrong. You don't want your readers to feel that. So do your research and see where things should go in your book. Also, think about why they're done that way. Some of it is it's just tradition, and some of it's for a reason. We put our acknowledgments where we do because readers might not care about that until the end of the book. Or maybe you have acknowledged some important figure and it's going to lend credibility to your book, so you want it to go at the front. When you're designing the interior of your book, take a field trip. Go to your local bookstore, Go to your section where you imagine your book being and look at the inside of those books. You can even take a ruler and measure the margins or the dimensions. Note what type of paper they're using, how spread out the words are on the page, how big the margins are, and other aspects of their interior design. Make sure your book is going to fit in. Do the same thing for a virtual book tour. 
take a look at ebooks in your genre. Pay attention to their line spacing and how they've designed their figures and graphs to appear on those e-readers. All of this is going to help your readers have a better experience. What are absolute must-haves as far as interior design goes for your book? Share it in the comments below. And for more advice on how to design your book and craft your story, subscribe to Ignited Ink Writing, a channel dedicated to helping authors like you transform your writing so it lingers with readers. Because writing that lingers gets remembered and recommended to others. I'm Kate Lumberby, editor and writer. To find out more about me, go to www.ignitedinkwriting.com. There you will also find a timeline of a book, Conception to Reader. This is going to help you figure out when you should design the interior of your book and when you should focus on other aspects of publishing. And now it's your turn to make sure your interior design is so exquisite it disappears and ignites your ink.